And what I thought we'd do is we'd talk a little bit about foreign affairs, international relations, and then uh, near the end of our allocation for this, for this portion of the program, get into some discussion about his role creating uh, the office of director for national intelligence and the role that intelligence has played, should play in our government. And so these are kind of the big, big topics. But I wanted to ask at the outset uh, for a snapshot look at US-Asia relations. Does the United States have a strategy? What are our priorities and uh, priorities and aims? And where are we succeeding? Where are we running into trouble? What a, what a great question. First of all, thanks, uh, Timor, for the introduction. Judge Gray, thank you very much. It's great to see you. Jeff, thanks for hosting me and coming up to LA to pick me up this morning in the pouring rain. Very kind of you to do that. And Clayton, thanks for your question. And yes, I was here first in 1985 and then again in uh, uh, 2011 and, and now. In 85, uh, I was reminded that actually that I was, uh, the topic was envir international environmental issues because I was Assistant Secretary of State for Oceans and International Environmental and Scientific Affairs, and we were concerned then about, uh, and we were negotiating about the issue, the prosaic but important issue of sewage coming from Tijuana in Mexico without permission across the border uh, of the United States and landing on the beaches uh, of San Diego. And there was one congressman by the name of Duncan Hunter who was very adamant that we help solve this problem. And we finally did work out uh, a pretty good solution. But fast forward, you've asked me about uh, our posture and position towards uh, the East Asia, uh, or towards Asia, and we don't call it East Asia, we don't say so much East Asia Pacific anymore, we talk about the Indo-Pacific, we've roped and looped India uh, into that. And you'll get some good insights from Nick Burns when he comes and speaks here about the steps that were taken during the Bush administration and since, Bush 43, to uh, improve our relationship uh, with the country of India. But I would say this, we have really, since the 19th century, or the latter part of the 19th century, been a country which uh, always had uh, at least one eye looking towards uh, the Pacific. We are a Pacific nation, we're on the Pacific Rim, and then we have uh, the scars to show for it uh, in the 20th century with the uh, wars, uh, uh, Japan, Korea, Vietnam, uh, and so forth. In fact, uh, I remember attending a lecture once that Richard Holbrook gave on how Americans perceive Asia, and at that time, uh, a poll had just been done by uh, a particular foundation, and the, the principal perception of Asia in the minds of most Americans was that about warfare, and we associated Asia with war. I think today we tend more to associate Asia with the fact that it has become the demographic and economic uh, epicenter uh, of the world. And I think that is what President Obama was saying when he made his famous pivot. So where do we stand in all of that? And I think if you just take it politically, uh, economically, and strategically, maybe in the reverse order. I, I think strategically, clearly, we, we still view Asia as playing an important role in our global strategy. We consider our alliance with Japan, the country of Japan, probably the most important single country alliance that we've got. The alliance with uh, South Korea is also important, not to mention uh, the one we have uh, with Australia and uh, perhaps to somewhat lesser extent with the Philippines and with with Thailand. So we still have a similar strategic project projection, if you will, uh, as we did before. And uh, notwithstanding the doubts that the president uh, elect and the president uh, expressed during the campaign and after about the importance and relevance of alliances, I think pretty much the policy has come out uh, 
reflecting fairly strong support for those alliance uh, relationships. And that's important. And I think it's very important to send the message to the countries of Asia, all of them, uh, including China, that we believe as a nation that we have enduring interests in that part of the world. Uh, second, uh, economically, um, we are, I, I think probably if I were to fall, and I, I bend over backwards to try to give Mr. Trump credit when credit is due, and I try not to just automatically criticize everything he initiates even before we know what's in the initiative, which seems to be a very popular sport, uh, particularly on the cable uh, television. But I must say, I think that the most serious mistake he's made in his administration so far was to withdraw that signature from the Trans-Pacific Partnership on his first day in office because it left us really uh, without any kind of unifying strategy other than those alliances that I mentioned to you uh, with the East Asia Pacific region, number one. I think and those it, are, those go are ahead. bilateral relationships, bilateral alliances. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, with Japan, with South Correct. Korea, with, with the Philippines, and these others, whereas TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, was a multilateral institution. Correct. And one of the comments that uh, academics and others have been making over the years is that what was lacking in our policies towards Asia and what is lacking in Asia, as distinct from Europe, is that not enough of these kinds of institutions have been built up. I mean, Europe's got not only NATO, but the EU and the OSCE, and you can go, there are myriad organizations that have a, quite a bit of influence in the state of affairs. There's not enough of that in the East Asia Pacific region, and we just knocked the props out of that particular one, and it left us devoid, really, of a multilateral economic strategy towards the region, and also, of course, created an opportunity for China. So I think we're a little bit on the back foot uh, economically vis-a-vis -vis Asia, though that is not to say that we don't have absolutely significant economic relationships, uh, starting with China itself, where we have $750 billion of two-way trade a year. And if you look at uh, the stock of our foreign investment in these different countries in Asia, it's still extremely uh, substantial. Uh, lastly, on the, on the political side, I think the, the atmospherics of, of relationships in, in Asia got off to a little bit of a rocky start for the reasons I mentioned before about some of the things the president has been saying about our alliances uh, and so forth. But I think, um, I think the administration has by and large shown that it takes Asian relationships extremely uh, seriously. And the other thing, of course, is the president, um, to his credit, um, puts quite a bit of value in personal diplomacy, and so he enjoys meeting with top-level leaders. Sometimes people will tell you, well, he, he enjoys meeting with the wrong ones, but, uh, but he does like uh, personal uh, diplomacy. He, ha he values his relationship with uh, Xi Jinping, which I believe can serve the United States' interest well. He's, he values his personal relationship with other uh, leaders as well. So anyway, that's a probably too long-winded an answer to no, your that's a, short that, question. <laughs> that's, a, that's a terrific opening. And I'm here from USC's US-China Institute, so we're going to talk uh, more about China, and I really right. appreciate that. But before we go there, uh, let's talk about just this term, Indo-Asia, you know, or Indo-Pacific. Indo-Pacific. Yeah, yeah. Indo-Pacific, and what that represents, uh, both positively, but also uh, in the case of the Chinese, they see that as part of a grand encirclement strategy. So, right, and there may even be a little bit of truth to that uh, suspicion on their part. I, I believe that what I referred to earlier about um, Condoleezza Rice and President Bush 43 uh, opening up towards India was a, was a strategic move on the part of the Bush 43 uh, administration, trying to rope uh, India more into the geopolitical uh, picture and to uh, involve them more in, in our 
policies and postures out in that part of the world. It would obviously not have been possible if it hadn't been for the end of the Cold War, because it, during the Cold War, India was aligned somewhat uh, with the Soviet Union. And it's not until the Soviet Union collapses and the Indian uh, economic reform process begins that this kind of thinking is even possible. Uh, but it is now, and there's no question that relations basically with India are on a positive trajectory. And uh, I think we do well to cultivate India. And if, uh, if uh, as one of the side effects of that policy, there's, it has a little bit of a uh, balancing effect vis-a-vis -vis the country of China, I don't think that's a bad thing at all. Uh, I think it's important to uh, bring and remind China that there are other countries around and that if we work with them, countries like India or the ASEAN countries, the Southeast Asian countries, uh, that can make a difference to the geopolitical equation out in that area. So the administration took the next step, this administration, of actually instead of calling it the East Asia Pacific region, which is what we've done traditionally over the decades, They've now gone and changed the name to the Indo-Pacific, uh, and there's logic to that. And uh, well, we'll see what happens going forward. Uh, thank you. And so, uh, in 1960, you get sent to Hong Kong. To Hong Kong. Okay. So, uh, just a few years after the end of the Korean War, very much the thick of the Cold War, uh, American and Chinese mutual antagonism, kind of a at a fever pitch, although it would rise even during the Cultural Revolution. And we have that, you have that in your past. And, and, and at lunch, Ambassador Negroponte showed me a picture of him meeting uh, China's Prime Minister, Premier Zhou Enlai. And you know, so he's been involved with affairs dealing with China for a long time, and also dealing with those countries on China's periphery. How do you see the US-China relationship? What, what do you find to be the central issues that we need to be focused on, and how can we move forward? So I think back, well, first just about Hong Kong for a moment. Back then, of course, it was a completely different place in a way than it is now. It was a British crown colony. None of us have thought that 1997 would ever come. Uh, we thought it was going to continue as this sort of little... Uh, uh, British enclave for the uh, foreseeable uh, future. You had to even had British some British policemen there wearing their British shorts and uh, their sort of Livingston hats directing traffic and stuff like that, which of course you don't see in Hong Kong today uh, at all. Uh, you couldn't figure out what was going on in China those days. We couldn't even tell whether there was an, uh, we couldn't ver verify whether there was a, a famine, which there was in fact, because we didn't have the kind of intelligence capabilities that we do today. We were reduced basically to either reading the Chinese press, we had a big, we rented the basement of the British American Tobacco Company and got our hands on every Chinese newspaper we could get a hold of and translate it and see if we get some gems out of that. And we interviewed refugees from China. Those were the two main ways of it. And China was poor, it was miserably poor. I went in 1972, it was very clear that this was a country uh, that really didn't at that particular time have much going for it. I think the key difference between then and later is of course the opening to China by Dr. Kissinger and by President Nixon was really a geopolitical step. It was part of this triangle of diplomacy between ourselves, uh, the Soviet Union, uh, and the People's Republic of China, and with sort of Vietnam uh, in the mix. Well, in the mix, because we were trying to disengage uh, from that uh, conflict. So it was really a, a relationship that was essentially geopolitical in nature. I mean, proof of the pudding is that in 79, when we established relations with China, and thereby automatically lifting the embargo, the trade embargo, uh, we had zero trade by definition, except whatever might have gotten across the borders illicitly. 
And in 79, we were, I was in the State Department, then we were asking ourselves, what are we going to buy from this country? That's what we were asking in 1979. What are we going to buy from China? And I looked at the data in 85, the grand total of US-China trade was $8 billion a year, and about evenly divided. And today, of course, it's over $700 billion, uh, and terribly lopsided, uh, 350 to 170, something, something like that. You can maybe even it out, make it a little, look a little better if you take our, our, our surplus of service uh, exports. So massive commercial and financial relationship uh, with China. Incredible people-to-people uh, -people relations, particularly with more than 300,000 Chinese uh, students coming to study uh, at universities in the United States. Uh, 5,600 at USC alone. There you go. And, and all of them usually paying full freight, if I'm not mistaken, uh, which has not escaped the notice of uh, the finance offices of our universities in this country. Um, so they pay the sticker price, right? Pretty much. Pretty much. Um, and then a whole host of other uh, important relationships, uh, not only trade, but of course investment on both sides. So it's dramatically altered. We can get into some of the sticking points, if you will, but I, I'd say it's moved from geopolitical to a full scope relationship. Yeah, there's, there's, it's definitely a full scope relationship. Uh, there's no area of life right. here in the United States that's not somehow connected. Uh, something like 25% of the particulate matter in the air over California originates in China. So pollution, as Ambassador Negroponte worked on, knows no boundaries. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and so certainly with trade and the flow, and if today is an average day, 8,000 Chinese came to the United States. Uh, most of them coming to Los Angeles, and many of them coming to Orange County for Shopping in Disneyland, right? But so we have Disney. this this commercial relationship. But what about uh, the security concerns? As you highlighted, uh, the Japanese are extremely nervous about the, the this concern, also about North Korea. And of course, President Trump saw China as an important partner in dealing with the challenge posed by North Korea. What might you say about uh, Chinese strategic thinking and how the United States seeks to engage China as well as to engage with those around China. Right. So, <laughs> it's, uh, well, first of all, it's kind of interesting. You know, I was in charge of the U.S.-China political dialogue when I was Deputy Secretary of State, and I met with the State Counselor a couple of times a year, Dai Bing Guo, who, and I still see him about once a year. He, he hosts uh, events at Peking University that I, uh, I attend. And, and, and one of the things that's interesting about Chinese, the Chinese posture and Chinese strategic thinking is they're very quick to tell you what they are not. We're not hegemons. We don't want to lead the global order. We, we, we watch you do it, and we just don't think we want to have to do that. <laughs> um, and interestingly, and I've attended speeches by the foreign minister and others, when they single out the different elements of their foreign policy, one of the items they will mention is preservation of the post-World War II uh, international order that were the, the, the Bretton Woods system and the international trading system and everything else. Why? Well, in part, of course, or large measure, because they've benefited enormously for, from it. It's worked for them. So they don't, I don't think, they, they, they think about this fairly carefully, and I don't think they want to throw out the baby uh, with, with the bathwater, and so, which is one of the reasons that causes me to believe that they will want to reach, I mean, we're right in the middle of this right now because we have our delegation, the government delegation in Beijing at the moment, talking trade and commerce and all. I don't think they want that system to be uh, abandoned by any means. Uh, they may want to see improvements. They may want to try to accommodate some of our concerns in order to, to help keep it alive. But the other issue 
is in the security area. And, and here, I, I think we come to something that is a long-term matter for those of us who are interested in foreign relations and foreign policy, and which we're just gonna have to think about very hard. I don't pretend to have the answer for you, but it seems to me we have to think about what kind of China are we going to have to deal with uh, in this century going forward, uh, in the lifetimes of our children and grandchildren. It's certainly going to be different. And some, many of the, these things are not things we can change. We can't change the fact that China has recovered from its century of humiliation. We can't change the fact that it's now either the second or the first largest, it certainly will be pretty soon, the largest economy in the world. We can't change all of those facts. I have heard some people, and this is where I think the thinking can sometimes get a little dangerous, that who feel that it is, uh, it is incumbent on us to prevent China from advancing like that. Is oh. this our option? I think it's the most, it's the silliest option I've ever heard of. It, I mean, I think what one has to advocate and be in favor of is that they adhere to the rules of the road, or that we get rules more clearly established with them and that they stick with them. But as long as they uh, prosper and make their money and uh, in, achieve their growth fair and square, then I think we've got to be prepared to accept that. But the idea that somehow we want to uh, foil their economic advancement, uh, I just don't, I think that's barking up the wrong tree. But we have our work cut out for us mentally because up until the end of the 19th century, we didn't think of ourselves as a global superpower, even though in 1870, I think our economy had already surpassed the British economy in uh, just pure numerical, you know, uh, GDP terms. But it didn't really dawn on us what our leadership role in world affairs was until World War I. And so we had that century, we basically had an extremely responsible role, and I think we're gonna continue to have it. And this idea that somehow, just because some people are getting a little bit tired of exercising global responsibility, I would ask you, what is the alternative? And every time I see Mr. Trump getting to the point of pulling the plug on something, oh, we're gonna get rid of NAFTA. We're gonna break the relationship with China. We're gonna do this, we're gonna, he, he, we're gonna, alliances, ah, we don't need those anymore. Let Korea and Japan develop nuclear weapons. He talks that way, sort of barroom talk, you know? And, but he always pulls back from it. I mean, I think there's something in his inner self and in the people around him who realize that these are extremely important relationships to the United States and uh, even while appealing or trying to appeal to his political base, he also has to face the reality of the importance of these relationships. And, and last point, of course, uh, they're becoming even more important because we're only 5% or whatever of the world population and our relative uh, economic strength at least and numerical strength is not quite what it was at the end of World War II. Yeah, re relative to other countries, right. uh, when we were the sole superpower, the only you know, power left standing. Well, we or in 1945, when we represented 45% of the world's GDP. That's exactly the case. And uh, many people in China think that America can't accept a China that is regionally supreme, a China whose economy surpasses that of the United States, science and technology uh, on a par, if not better, than the United States. And they believe that the grand American scheme is to hold China back. Well, that and that bringing up things like human rights and other kinds of issues are just tactical. You want to hurt us so that you can sanction us, you want to sanction us, or whatever. Um, 
Well, therein you you I think one of the, the, therein lies the rub. You you raised one issue that's I think extremely interesting. To the extent that China has hegemonistic pretensions, and just let's leave that question out there. Um, to what extent are they just regional or are they global? And I think they would protest loudly that they do not have global pretensions. I think the minute you get into talk about East Asia Pacific region issues, then it's more, what are you guys doing here anyway, right? Huh? It's a little bit that kind of conversation. You know, why are you here? And, uh, you know, why? These alliances, these uh, Dai Bing Guo would tell me this quite often, and they're not, I mean, they, they will admit to this. They, they say, well, aren't these alliances a little bit out of date? I mean, they, which is another way of saying, well, <laughs> why, should, why are you so engaged in this area? So that's the part we've got to work out, the modus vivendi that hasn't yet been worked out between us. But I think it's important to say to our Chinese friends, that we're not leaving and that we're probably going to uphold these arrangements. I, I, I really believe that. Uh, and so we're going to have to have, find some way to manage it in such a way that there isn't some kind of uh, conflict uh, between us. And there simply has got to be room for two large powers with interests in that part of the world. And uh, so when they claim the South China Sea as a Chinese lake, they're going to get a pushback. Well, that's what they do. If you look at the lines, uh, uh, they'll get pushback from us. Yeah, the East China Sea, South China Sea as Chinese lakes is something that the United States has flat out said, will not, we will not accept that. So you can ask the logical follow-up questions. Well, what are you going to do about it? You know, people always say, well, what are you going to do about it? Well, sometimes you can't do anything about it at that particular point in time. They've created some facts on the ground. They've gone and controlled these so-called features in the South China Sea and built some funny looking airstrips on top of them. Um, but you can preserve your legal position, you can preserve your moral position, your political position, and maybe wait for a better time to solve the problem. At the moment, you sort of have to agree to disagree and manage the relationship uh, as best you can. And the other added point I, made, I meant to make it earlier is, one of the reasons these economic discussions are so important is so that we can better segment the relationship with China. If we can get the economic and commercial relationship parked in the right place, then it makes it a little easier to isolate the other issues and work on them. Uh, but if everything is in turmoil at the same time, that is not good. Yeah, sensible words from somebody who has been on the front lines in the strategic economic dialogue and all of these other sorts of things and continues to talk to influential Chinese. But now it's time for your questions. Okay. So first question that came in in a couple different forms, but it has to do with when, where, and how often do you see China potentially becoming an ally of Russia? It's interesting, I was actually at the national conference which you all are invited to every fall, and we were at a think tank and that was one of the questions that was put out to their panel and they were completely split in terms of how often they felt that that would take place. Well, the history of that relationship is not a particularly happy one, I don't think, from the Chinese perspective. They certainly chafed enormously during the Sino-Soviet uh, era, if you will. And uh, I think one of our great intelligence failures, by the way, talk about DNI, in the 1960s was we were much too slow to recognize the implications of the Sino-Soviet split because LBJ and Dean Rusk and others saw the Soviet bloc as a monolith and they refused to believe the, the evidence that was coming to their attention about deep divisions between them. So I think if they were to reunite in some kind of way in an alliance or in a friendship of some kind, I don't think they have a treaty of f friendship anymore, right? What they used to call a peace and friendship. Those were the, like the standard alliance. They certainly don't have that, and I don't think they'll ever get to that. 
Whatever they do, it'll be a matter of convenience and expediency. I think it'll be tactical. I think it's in part to just to uh, keep us a little nervous. And it works for that. Yeah, and it, as evidenced by the question and the concern. Uh, the nationalist impulses, I think, are going to preclude anything deeper. Well, then I think the Russians might care more about trying to create the impression of some kind of alliance with China vis-a-vis -vis, you know, us than the, chi the Chinese. I think it's important to emphasize wh whatever else China's doing, when you talk to them, when you watch the body language and all of that, they appear to value the relationship with the United States. Um, I think they hold this relationship in high importance. Interesting. So this comes from a former chair of ours. Uh, it's from Fred Mary, And he said that he had the honor of working for you at uh, DNI. And his question is, in 2011, the last time you came, um, he asked you specifically what was the biggest threat facing our country. At that time, your answer was the national debt, our national debt. Uh, did I his, say that? He did. Really? Whereas, uh, <laughs> so his question is, do you still feel that way? Well, um, it, it, look. Uh, You'd have to say it a little more broadly. I mean, I think it is, if you ask me to rank the problems, the most serious problems of our society, I think you'd have to put the national debt either at or, or near the top. I don't think there's any question about it. And it continues to be, and it's growing further, <laughs> really. But, um, it, you know, in terms of foreign threats, I don't know if we got into that discussions back then. I think what you have seen is a bit of an evolution from a preoccupation back then with terrorism and international terrorism uh, to a little bit more now about state threats uh, with the rise of Russia, which has risen more and, and flexed its muscles more since that time. There's been the invasion of Crimea and so forth. So I think state threats are probably figure a bit more prominently today than they did back at that time. If we could ask you about the creation of the Directorate of National Intelligence. You were a producer of intelligence as a Foreign Service officer. Mm -hmm. You were a consumer as a policymaker at the top levels of our, of our government. And then you were the first so-called conductor trying to orchestrate you know, cooperation and exchange across the intelligence agencies. What, why was that so necessary? And what has been the impact of the creation of the DNI? Yeah, I would not be one of those who would argue that it was necessary. I think it became politically inevitable because of the WMD fiasco, the fact that we didn't find WM, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, the fact that we fell hook, line, and sinker for this phony source who told us that uh, Saddam had uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction and we fell for his uh, reports uh, even though uh, we, could, we never really got any corroboration. It turned out he was making the stuff up he was an Iraqi source who told, he, he basically told us what he said because he wanted us to do what we did. Uh, and it fell on these very willing ears, if you will, the people who wanted to believe this kind of stuff. And that just sort of fed into the prevalent narrative in Washington at that time. And so when the 9-11 com Commission and the 9-11 families had already been advocating for intelligence reform and the creation of a DNI, but Mr. Bush resisted that, in part because his father had been the director of the CIA. He didn't want to emasculate, eviscerate the Central Intelligence Agency. But then when the WMD fiasco erupts in the summer of 2004, an election year, no less, and John Kerry, the candidate for the other party, comes out in favor of the reform, and Congress has got ready this legislation, Mr. Bush felt he had no choice but to go along with it. So we created it. What did we do, basically? We created a community management function, which already existed in the old arrangement. The CIA director had two hats. He was the director of central intelligence, wherein he was the community manager, and then he was the director 
of the CIA, the Central Intelligence Agency, which made him the operational chief of our uh, uh, intelligence uh, machinery. Um, and uh, they took that management function away, created the director of national intelligence, and that's what I inherited. What they did, though, was have some add-ons. You know, it's like going into the automobile dealer and then getting all these extras. And we got a bunch of extras tacked on to the DNI, including the, the President's Daily Brief, the uh, National Intelligence Council. I got a lot of analytic functions, uh, particularly the strategic analytic functions came over to the DNI, which was frankly the part of the job I enjoyed the most, uh, being sort of the analyst in chief and attending the President's briefings every day. When he, he, Mr. Bush liked his intelligence, he got it uh, six days a week. Okay, I'm going to shift a little bit. We have somebody up here obviously has such a breadth of geographical experience, and we've had questions from all over the world. We've kind of hit some DNI stuff, uh, some China-related stuff. There's been a handful of questions on Latin America. He's former ambassador to Mexico. Um, two, twofold, I'm kind of merging these two together. One is reflecting back, what are your thoughts on NAFTA? And the second, um, as former ambassador to Mexico, what involvement uh, did you have with Mexico regarding immigration issues with the U.S.? And then can you comment on our current, current situation at the yeah. U.S. border? Well, what are my thoughts on, on NAFTA? First of all, I have, uh, in terms of my country experiences and, and my ambassadorial jobs, I consider the achievement of the North American Free Trade Agreement as the most important single accomplishment uh, with which my career has been associated. So, uh, I mean, I thought that was important. I thought it was strategic. I thought the Bush administration sort of got it. There were a lot of Texans there. You go to Texas, they understand the relationship uh, with Mexico. And uh, it was Bush, Baker, uh, Mossbacker, they were all from, from down there. And uh, so I think it was a, a very important accomplishment. I think it's borne positive results for both countries. It's quadrupled the level of trade, at least, uh, between the United States and Mexico. And it had a, a side effect also of bringing Canada more into the relationship with, uh, with Mexico. The, it, it helped Canada discover Mexico from a commercial and a trade uh, point of view. So I think it's been extremely positive. I'm very much in favor of it. Uh, and uh, I'm working with people in Washington, Washington to uh, try and promote the, uh, the adoption by the Congress of this renegotiated NAFTA, which is now called the U.S. United States Mexico Canada Agreement. So I, th I think that's uh, important. Your other question was? Immigration. Oh, immigration. immigration. Well, we had the Simpson, Mazzoli, various re reforms came into effect during the time I was ambassador there. I was from there from 89 to 93. We had significant I immigration reform then. There was an amnesty. There were a lot of agricultural workers who were admitted to the United States. You remember these, this category of special agricultural workers and things like that? Um, it was a period where I think between conservative uh, Western farmers and various other elements of our society, we've managed to patch together a coalition that was in favor of more immigration uh, from Mexico. Um, I thought it was extremely uh, positive. And uh, by the way, now the, the immigration isn't so much from Mexico. The flow from Mexico has gone way down, in part because of the prosperity brought about by NAFTA. And secondly, because if you look at the demographics, the size of Mexican families has uh, fallen off substantially. The number of children uh, uh, born and the birth rate and so forth. So uh, the problem now is more Central America. And uh, my thoughts on that would be not too different from what we did with uh, Mexico, which is I think we've got to try and focus more on what it is we can do to help the Central American economy so that there will be more economic opportunities in those countries rather than everybody feeling that the only salvation in life is to get out of your country and come up to the United States. It's been compounded by this problem of the gangs 
these violent gangs who really are a, a menace. Interesting. Uh, Ken Peterson had a question. It uh, zeroes back into East Asia. Under what circumstances would China move on Taiwan, and how firm is the prevailing view that we would commit our that we would commit our nation's blood and treasure to confronting such an aggressive political military action? Well, our approach has been cautious, but it's also been deliberately ambiguous so that uh, it raises the calculation for China. It, they have to think hard about what our reaction might be if they were to uh, use force against Taiwan. But meanwhile, we've got the Taiwan Relations Act, which commits us to providing defense uh, articles to Taiwan, and we do that. We help them maintain a strong defense establishment, but we do not have a mutual defense treaty like we did uh, prior to the establishment of relations with Beijing. In fact, the day we established relations with Beijing, we abrogated the mutual defense treaty between ourselves and Taiwan. Um, what caused North Korea to invade South Korea? You remember that one? And it was, uh, Dean Acheson said that we'd withdrawn our line uh, of our perimeter of defense uh, south. Or we, we, Korea was no in longer included in our Asia Pacific defense perimeter. So, you know, we got to be careful not to trip into this. Uh, not say anything that sends misleading signals. Meanwhile, maintain good relations, try to cultivate relations with both uh, Beijing while maintaining relationships with Taiwan, continue to supply them defense weaponry under the Taiwan Relations Act, and just hope to keep buying time for uh, some possible eventual peaceful resolution of this issue between the People's Republic of China and Taiwan. You know, one of the striking things, uh, first of all, it's, it, this is an atypical audience. The vast majority of Americans don't know the difference between Taiwan and Thailand, right? <laughs> uh, and, and so the question about would we go to war, uh, you know, couldn't be submitted to the American public. But in China, Taiwan is perceived to be a major, a major issue in the US-China relationship. And many Chinese people assume that if we were to come to war, that Taiwan might be a part of it. But as Ambassador Negropani just explained, uh, our policy of strategic ambiguity on this, neither side quite knowing what the United States might do, has helped to keep the peace. And this what? How many, there's several trillion dollars, I think, of Taiwan investment in, on the mainland in China. I mean, talk about a body blow to the global economy. If, let's say we didn't even get involved, but just if there were a conflict between Taiwan and China, what an economic mess. Yeah, call your broker. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, final question, staying in that, that general region. Um, this comes from John Marconi. How do you evaluate the Japanese milita military strength, and do you actually, and is it actually a buffer to China's strength, and also your comments on kind of the changing feelings in Japan uh, regarding military What was the middle part of that question? How do I evaluate? So how do you evaluate the Japanese military strength? Right. Is a bu is it, do you consider it a buffer? A buffer, To a certain no. extent, to China's strength? And mm -hmm. then your thoughts on shifting views on the military itself in, in Japan. Well, I mean, Mr. Abe has been one of those who's been trying to push the envelope, right? Uh, with respect to Japan having, uh, enhancing its military capabilities. And I think he's probably right to do that. Uh, um, you know, World War II ended a long, long time ago. Um, Japan has not, was not spending that much on, on defense. Now they're spending more. I think it's good that they do that. I think that it's good that they expand their, their involvement in global affairs. They've got now the third largest economy in the world. They're still very, very significant. 
And um, yes, I think also, there. I don't know about a buffer, but yeah, they're one of the counterweights that, that can be out there. Um, so I think it's important in many different respects. Do I, do I think it, there's a danger that, China, that Japan will they'll all become a bunch of samurais again and uh, that will uh, you know, go back to some kind of uh, 1930s uh, or you know, pre-World War II situation? I don't think so. I think there's, there's a measured way in which this, this can be done and uh, we ought to think of ways to do it. Yeah. Or they ought to think of ways to do it. Dr. Dewey? Yeah, no, just to support what Ambassador Negroponte just said, uh, the vast majority of the Japanese public the last thing that they want is armed conflict with anyone. Uh, there's not a drumbeat, uh, you know, in any way, shape, or form. And you know, Prime Minister Abe has been pushing the envelope. This, I mean, this goes back to the 1980s with Nakasone and uh, becoming a normal country, mm -hmm. right? Having a, a military that does other things. Right, and then look at the other side of the coin. Uh, you have Japan and Germany, both of whom have been committed to these kind of peaceful uh, sort of uh, road, road map. And then you have political leaders like Mr. Trump saying, you know, we, we paid for your defense uh, all these years with these enormous defense budgets that we have and your economies have skyrocketed and uh, we're losing in the economic competition with you. And so there, there's that element as well. So I think that increased Japanese defense spending in that sense is uh, kind of well-received in Washington. Fantastic.